Welcome. Uh, I'm Alan Habus, the uh, Thurgood Marshall Provost, and this is the third in this academic year of the uh, convocation speakers of the Council of Provost. And I'm delighted uh, to welcome you, and I'm also delighted to uh, make this introduction for Mr. Derek Walcott. So uh, first, let me begin with a lot of thank yous, uh, and there are just almost too many organizations to thank, but I'll work from memory. Uh, one, I'd like to thank the La Jolla Playhouse uh, for the Weiss Theater and the Department of Theater and Dance, uh, the Chair um, Charlie Oates and the MSO uh, Mark Mulpey. The Council of Provost um, uh, and all the six colleges, Ravel, uh, Warren, uh, Six College, Roosevelt, Muir, Marshall, uh, did I forget one? No, they're all six, okay. Uh, also, uh, from the Division of Arts and Humanities, uh, Dean uh, Michael Bernstein. Uh, also, uh, the Helen Edison Lecture Series, uh, and uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Art Ellis uh, from the Office of uh, Graduate Study uh, Research now. And um, I also want to thank the UCSD Libraries for sponsoring this event. Uh, it was a great uh, consortium of, of people. So a big hand for everybody. Uh, Mr. Derek Walcott, poet and playwright, was the winner of the 1992 Nobel Prize for Literature. He was born in the West Indian island of St. Lucia and known for his body of work that blends Caribbean, English, and African traditions. In awarding him the Nobel Prize in 1992, the Academy praised him for a poetic aura of great luminosity sustained by a historic vision, the outcome of a multicultural achievement. Since publishing his first poems at the age of 18, Mr. Walcott has published over 20 volumes of poetry, including In a Green Night, 1962, Another Life, 1973, The Star Apple Kingdom, 1979, Collected Poems 1948 to 1984, which came out in 1986. The Arkansas Testament 1987, Omaris 1990, on, on the Odysseus myth. Uh, the Bounty 1997, uh, Tipolo's Hound 2000. And lastly, Selected Poems, which came out just recently, 1962 to 2004, the poems of that period which was featured um, in the cover story in the April 8th Sunday New York Times book review. The poet Richard Wilbur, former poet laureate of the United States, has called Mr. Walcott, quote unquote, one of the best poets writing in the English language. Mr. Walcott is known also for his major work in theater. He has written numerous plays, including Dream on Monkey Mountain, 1970, Tijin and His Brothers, 1958, The Last Carnival, and The Odyssey, a stage version, 1993. He also wrote the story and the lyrics for Paul Simon's musical on Broadway, The Cape Man, which opened 1999, 1998 in New York. Mr. Walcott won the prestigious MacArthur Foundation Genius Award, 1981. He currently is a professor in Boston University's English department. It is my honor to present to you tonight Mr. Derek Walcott. I'm going to read tonight from Omeros, the long poem that has been called epic, but I don't think of it as that, except one means bulk in terms of epic. I suppose there are epical elements in this long poem because it has to deal at some point with slavery and that section that I'm going to read tonight has to do with um, the dispossession that happens in slavery and the return. Everybody on the left side of the Greenwich Meridian is an immigrant. The only people who weren't immigrants 
uh, the American Indian. Um, anybody else crossing that line is crossing into another world or into a world that was called new but continued to perpetrate the same vices as the old or maybe even more so. But it means that for every person who crosses that line to live on this side of the world that they are American from the North Pole to the South Pole from Mexico to Chile to they are American. That's the idea of America after America, America Vespucci, the explorer. What that means is that every American, everybody on the side of the New World, has to go through, as say in Greek mythology, people descend into hell and come back out. One has to cross that line, and in that crossing into the New World, a whole transition happens and a loss happens. One has to forget, one is expected to forget, or if not to forget, to commemorate what was forgotten or has been forgotten. The long names that come from European tribes are shortened to say Smith, um, when it was Smithowski or somebody. Um, with that change of name, there's a change of identity and an effort of, mem of memory. And that huge effort of memory, a huge effort of memory, is the African experience in terms of having been made to forget where your home is. Um, and in some cases, it's violent. In some cases, it is a little more benign, but it still requires a process of eradication of your origins. Uh, sometimes the origins disappear entirely. Sometimes the origins are made to disappear by force, um, by expansion. But that effort has to be made to return to one's identity. I have tried to write that kind of subject, and I think every, every American does write this, because no American here, barring the American Indian, is original. Is Everybody else is an immigrant. Um, that should be thought of when we think of what is a, apparently Mexican problem or something. Um, the section that I'm going to read has to do with a fisherman called Achille, named after the Greek warrior Achilles. The book is called Homeros because it's just the Greek name for Homer. The debt to Homer is not a conscious template kind of debt to another book. It would be pointless to rewrite um, a great work. It happens in Borges that somebody uh, rewrites Don Quixote, and he writes Don Quixote with the exact words. Only way to rewrite it is to put down the exact words. So um, I haven't tried to do that. What I tried to do was to say that everything we know here in terms of, say, the classics or poetry or theater or even our own names or our own customs come from, comes from association rather than identity. In other words, there are similes. We live in the new world in a condition of simile, that this is like what we thought we knew. Uh, this Africa that we remember is a simile. And so are the other countries, whether it's Czechoslovakia or Russia, or other place that uh, become parallels or alternate lives through tribal memory. And the great technique of colonization, of course, is to erase the tribal memory, to erase everything that venerates that memory so that one is forced to accept what one is offered. So that if your name is changed on Ellis Island, then you're supposed to forget what you used to be. 
Um, that is the American effort, I think. The whole spiritual effort of America is an effort to remember origins. It is also an effort that is the same thing as, say, a castaway, which is that there is a wreckage that happens, and one has to take and assemble pieces of that wreckage and shape the spirit from those fragments or pieces that have come with the virtual idea of erasure or shipwreck. This uh, book um, is not a copy of Homer. It doesn't make logical parallels in terms of the Odyssey. What it does have that is true is image, heraldic, iconic images. One great icon iconic image in the Caribbean is that of a sail, a sail at sea in a huge expanse is a metaphor, a symbol for the travails of Odysseus. And that is what a great poem or great work of art can do. It can create one iconic image that does for everything out of that simple, um, almost brush stroke of an event. So that if one is in the Caribbean, and even if you're flying and you look down below, and you see a canoe with a single sail, it's either going home or coming from harbor. And that is an Odyssean image. It doesn't mean that the guy in the canoe has read Homer. It doesn't mean that the landscape is imitating a classic. Geology doesn't have any memory. Geography doesn't have any memory. So when people uh, describe the efforts of the new world as being mimicry as being imitation, they're forgetting that they should not give attributes to rocks and to trees and to the sea. So the sea in the Caribbean doesn't have a classic memory of how it used to be the Aegean. That would be absurd. But in literary criticism sometimes, that's the process by which one goes. What one has to know in the Caribbean, and it takes an effort to do it, is to try to erase deliberately, in the same way that a tribal memory is erased, to erase an identity that is not based on an imitation of another culture. To preserve that, that is extremely difficult, and it is repressed. It has to be repressed, because otherwise it will grow dangerous, and it will have a strong identity that threatens the ruling identity. And that is in the individual. The individual effort that has to be done by the American immigrant is something that does not feel a complete spiritual debt to the older country that separates itself but still isolates and identifies itself as belonging to that past but not possessed by it. And that is the whole thing that Whitman was saying uh, what it, about what it meant, what it means still to be an American. But everybody on this side of the world is American. And I don't mean that he's a citizen of the United States. I think that's an experience that one is talking about is the same experience of what Odysseus um, says in Dante and for which he is punished. Odysseus is punished in Dante because he came home safely through all his trials and then he became restless with knowledge and he was punished for leaving that comfort that God, the gods had provided and going out in search of human vice and worth. In other words, always to know as much as God. And as corny and as evangelical as it may sound, I think every poet particularly knows that this is an extremely dangerous time. It is a Promethean time. It is a Ulyssian time in which our strength, uh, the bomb that we have, the fact that we can destroy, the fact that we do destroy, uh, brings man in proximity to a belief that he is a god. Um, and this is Odysseus's daring. So that's humble sail that is Odyssean. When we look at it, it can contain that whole thing that is there in Dante of the sail that goes home and becomes dissatisfied with safety because the human spirit 
becomes dissatisfied with peace. This section then has what happens is that Achille, which is a French Creole pronunciation of Achilles, goes out fishing and then he suffers from sunstroke. And in that moment of sunstroke, when the length of time is not defined and controlled, he returns to Africa, he returns to his origins, and he meets his ancestors, but time is a different thing now. It's not the present and it's not the past. It is a present, um, it is an event that has no beginning and no ending, really. Um, in the first section, he's out at sea on this canoe, and he drifts further and further away in his dream, in his moment of uh, sunstroke, if you want. There is a bird in the book, a swift, a sea swift, that carries the canoe to Africa. It's a part of the fantasy that this little bird could have so much strength as an engine that it can take the canoe back across to where Achille came from. Um, in that sense, it is a reversal of the middle passage. And it's taking Achille on that journey that everyone has to make to return to be, to possess where we have wound up. The model of the design of the poem is in what I tried to combine was a homage both to Homer and to Dante, even if it's an English poem, as originators of the long poem. So that there's a hexametrical rhythm with uh, a stanzaic design of three lines and a Tzorima design, which is the Dante homage. So at the beginning, there's this bird taking the canoe back across the Atlantic. And all of this is happening in that moment of oblivion or forgetfulness, but also in that moment of powerful tribal memory. Chapter 24. From his heart's depth, he knew she was never coming back as he followed the skipping of a sea swift over the waves changing hills, as if the humming horizon bow had made Africa the target of its tiny arrow. When he saw the swift flail and vanish in a trough, he knew he'd lost Helen. The mate was cleaning the bilge with the rusted pail when the swift reappeared like a sunlit omen, widening the joy that had vanished from his work. Sunlight entered his hands. They gave that skillful twist that angled the blade for the next stroke. Half away from last night's blocko, the mate waveringly pissed over the side, keeping his staggering balance. Fish will get drunk, Ashiel grinned. The mate cupped his hands in the sea and lathered his head. All right, work start. He fitted the trawling rods. Achille felt the rim of the brimming morning being brought like a gift by the handles of the headland. He was at home. This was his garden. God bless the speed of the swift. God bless the wet head of the mate sparkling with foam and his heart trembled with enormous tenderness for the purple-blue water and the wilting shore, tight and thin as a fish line, and the hill's blue smoke, his muscles bulging like porpoises from each oar, but the wrists wrenched deftly after the lifted stroke, mesmerizing him with the incantatory meter. The swift made a secular, semicircular turn over the hills then, like a feathery lure, she bobbed over the wake, the same distance from the stern. He felt she was guiding and not following them, 
ever since she leapt from the blossoms of the froth hooked to his heart, as if her one arrowing aim was his happiness, and that was blessing enough. Steadily she kept her distance. He said the name that he knew her by, L'Irondelle des Antilles, the tag on Maud's quilt. The mate jigged the bamboo rods from which the baits trawled. Then it frightened Achille that this was no swallow, but the bait of the gods, that she had seen the gods' body torn from its hill. The horned island sank. This meant they were far out, perhaps 20 miles over the unmarked fathoms where the midshipmen watched the frigate come about, where no anchor has enough rope and no plummet plums. His cold heart was heaving in the ancestral soil of the ocean that had widened around the last point where the trades bent the almonds like a candle flame. He stood as the swift suddenly shot past the hull so closely that he thought he heard a cry from the small parted beak and he saw the whole world globed in the passing sorrow of her sleepless eye. The mate never saw her. He watched as Ashil furled both oars into one oar and laid them parallel in the grave of in God we trust, like man and wife, like grandmother and grandfather, with ritual solicitude then stood balancing with a knife. The words, in God we trust, was not a mistake. Once in St. Lucia, walking on the beach, I came across a canoe called, in God we trust, T-R-O-U-S-T, and I thought that was terrific. It's better than the ordinary thing of everybody knows, in God we trust. And I thought of the care with which this painter had made a mistake, and that the care of that mistake to me contained more faith than the familiarity of saying, in God we trust. So from now on, I want that put on your coin, in God we trust. Ashil watches the swift as it carries his boat across the Atlantic. Outrunner of flying fish, under the geometry of the hidden stars, a wire flashed and faded, taut as a catch, this might of the sky-touching sea, towing a pirogue a thousand times her own weight with a hummingbird's electric wings, this engine that shot ahead of each question like an answer, once Achille had questioned his name and his origin. She touched both worlds with her rainbow, this frail dancer leaping the breakers, this dart of the meridian. She could loop the stars with her fish line. She, try, she tired porpoises. She circled epochs with her outstretched span. She gave a straight answer when one was required. She skipped the dolphin's question. She stirred every spine of a sea egg, tickling your palm rank with the sea. She shut the ducks of a starfish. She was the mind messenger, and her speed outdarted memory. She was the swift that he had seen in the cedars in the form of clouds when she had shot across the blue ridges of the waves to a god's orders. And he, at the beck of her beak, watched the bird hum the whipping Atlantic and felt he was headed home. Where whales burst into flower and sails turned back from a tiring horizon, she shot with curled feet close to her wet belly, round-eyed, her ruddering beak towing in God we troused so fast that he felt his feet drumming on the ridged keelboard, its sharing motion whirred by the swift's flywheel into open ocean. Chapter 25. Mangroves, their ankles in water, walked with the canoe. The swift, racing its browner shadow, screeched, then veered into a dark inlet. It was the last sound Ashil knew from the other world. He feathered the paddle, stared away from the groping mangroves whose muddy shells slipped watered crocodiles, slitting the pods of their eyes. Then the horned river horses rolling over themselves could capsize a keel. It was like the African movies he had yelled at in childhood. 
The endless river unreeled those images that flickered into real mirages. Naked mangroves walking beside him, knotted logs wriggling into the water, the wet, yawning boulders of oven mouth hippopotami. A skeletal warrior stood up straight in the stern and guided his shoulders, clamped his neck in cold iron, and altered the oar. Achille wanted to scream. He wanted the brown water to harden into a road, but the river widened ahead and closed behind him. He heard screeching laughter in a swaying tree as monkeys swung from the rafter of their treehouse and the bared sound rotted the sky like their teeth. For hours the river gave the same show for nothing. The canoe's mouth muttered its lie. The deepest terror was the mud, the mud with no shadow like the clear sand. Then the river coiled into a bend. He saw the first signs of men, tall, sapling, fishing stakes. He came into his own beginning and his end, for the swiftness of a second is all that memory takes. Now the strange, inimical river surrenders its stealth to the sunlight, and a light inside him wakes, skipping centuries, ocean and river, and time itself. And God said to Ashil, look, I've given you permission to come home. His eye send the sea swift as a pilot, the swift whose wings is the sign of my crucifixion, and thou shalt have no God should in case you forget my commandments. And Ashil felt the homesick shame and pain of his Africa. His heart and his bare head were bursting as he tried to remember the name of the river and the tree god in which he stared, whose hollow body carried him to the settlement ahead. He remembered the sunburnt river with its spindly stakes and the peaked huts platformed above the spindles where thin naked figures as he rode past looked unkindly or kindly in their silence. The silence an old fence kindles in a boy's heart. They walked with his homecoming canoe past bonfires in a scorched clearing near the edge of the soft lipped shallows whose noise hurt his drumming heart as the pirogue slid its raw painted wedge towards the crazed sticks of a vine pass fastened pear. The river was sloughing its old skin like a snake in wrinkling sunshine. The sun resumed its empire over this branch of the Congo. The prow found its stake in the river and nuzzled it the way that a piglet finds its favorite dug in the sweet grunting sow. And now each cheek ran with his own clear rivulet of tears as Ashil, weeping, fastened the bow of the dog out, wiped his eyes with one dry palm, and felt a hard hand help him up the shaking pier. Half of me was with him, one half with a midshipman by a Dutch canal, but now neither was happier or unhappier than the other. An old man put an arm around a shield, and the crowd, chattering, followed both. They touched his trousers, his undershirt, the hands scrabbling the texture as a kitten does with cloth till they stood before an open hut. The sun stands with expectant silence. The river stops talking, the way silence sometimes suddenly turns off a market. The wind squatted low in the grass. A man kept walking steadily towards him, and he knew by that walk it was himself in his father, the white teeth, the widening hands. He sought his own features in those of their life-giver and saw two worlds mirrored there. The hair was surf curling around a sea rock, the forehead a frowning river, and they swirled in the estuary of a bewildered love. And time stood between them, the only interpreter of their lips joined babble, the river with the foam, and the chuckles of water under the sticks of the pear where the tribe stood like sticks themselves, reversed by reflection. Then they walked up to the settlement, and it seemed as they chattered, everything was rehearsed for ages before this. He could predict the intent of his father's gestures. He was moving with the dead. Women paused at their work, then smiled at the warrior returning from his battle with smoke from the kingdom where he had been captured. They cried, 
and were happy. Then the fishermen sat near a large tree under whose dome stones sat in a circle. His father said, Afolabi, touching his own heart, in the place you have come from, what do they call you? Time translates, tapping his chest, the son answers, Ashil. The tribe rustles, Ashil. Then, like cedars at sunrise, the mutterings settle. Afolabi, Ashil. What does the name mean? I have forgotten the one that I gave you. But it was, it seems, many years ago. What does it mean? Ashil, well, I too have forgotten. Everything was forgotten. You also. I do not know. The deaf sea has changed around every name that you gave us. Trees, men. We yearn for a sound that is missing. Afolabe. A name means something. The qualities desired in a son and even a girl child. So even the shadows who called you expected one virtue, since every name is a blessing. Since I am remembering the hope I had for you as a child. Unless the sound means nothing, then you would be nothing. Did they think you were nothing in that other kingdom? I do not know what the name means. It means something, maybe. What's the difference? In the world I come from, we accept the sounds we were given. Men, trees, water, and therefore Ashir. If I pointed and I said, that is the name of that man, that tree, and this father, would every sound be a shadow that crossed your air without the shape of a man or a tree? What would it be? And just as branches sway in the dusk from their fear of amnesia, of oblivion, the tribe began to grieve. Ashil, what would it be? I can only tell you what I believe or had to believe. It was prediction and memory to bear myself back, to be carried here by a swift or the shadow of a swift making its cross on water. With the same sign I was blessed with, with the gift of this sound whose meaning I still do not care to know. Afolabi, no man loses his shadow except it is in the night. And even then his shadow is hidden, not lost. At the glow of sunrise, he stands on his own name in that light. When he walks down to the river with the other fishermen, his shadow stretches in the morning and yawns. But you, if you are content with not knowing what our names mean, then I am not Afolabi, your father. And you look through my body as the light looks through a leaf. I am not hair or shadow. And you nameless son are only the ghost of a name. Why did I never miss you? until you returned. Why haven't I missed you, my son, until you were lost? Are you the smoke from a fire that never burned? There was no answer to this as in life. Ashil nodded, the tears glazing his eyes, where the past was reflected as well as the future. The white foam lowered its head. I sang of quiet Ashil, Afolabi's son, who never ascended in an elevator, who had no passport since the horizon needs none, never begged nor borrowed, was nobody's waiter, whose end when it comes will be a death by water, which is not for this book, which will remain unknown and unread by him. I sang the only slaughter that brought him delight and that from necessity of fish, sang the channels of his back in the sun. I sang our wide country, the Caribbean Sea, who hated shoes, whose souls were as cracked as a stone, who was gentle with ropes, who had one suit alone, whom no man dared insult and who insulted no one, whose grin was a white breaker cresting, but whose frown was a growing thunderhead, whose fist of iron would do me a greater honor if it held on to my caskets all ox than mine lifting his own when both anchors are lowered in the one island. But now the idyll dies, the goblet is broken, and rainwater trickles down the brown cheek of a jar from the clay of Choiseul. So much left unspoken by my chirping nib, and my earth door lies ajar. I lie wrapped in a flower sack sail, the clods thud on my rope lowered canoe. Rasping shovels scrape a dry rain of dirt on its hold. 
but turn your head when the sea almond rattles or the rust-leaved grape from the shells of my unpharaonic pyramid towards paper shredded by the wind and scattered like white gulls that separate their names from the foam and nod to a fisherman with his khaki dog that skitters from the wave crash, then frown at his form for one swift second. In its earth trough, my pirogue with its brass-handled oarlocks is sailing, not from but with them, with Hector, with Maud in the rhythm of her beds traveled over, with a swirling log lifting its mast head from the swell. Let the deep hymn of the Caribbean continue my epilogue. May waves remove their shawls as my mourners walk home to their rusted villages, good shoes in one hand, passing a boy who walked through the ignorant foam and saw a sail going out or else coming in and watched asterisks of rain puckering the sand. Out of the element, the thrashing mackerel thudded silver then leaden. The vermilion scales of snappers faded like sunset. The wet mossed coral sea fans that winnowed weeds in the wiry water stiffened to bony lace, and the dripping tendrils of an octopus wrung its hands at the slaughter from the gutting knives. Achille unstitched the entrails and hurled them on the sand for the palm-ribbed mongrels and the sawing flies. As skittish as hyenas, the dogs trotted, then paused, angling their muzzles sideways to gnaw on trembling legs, then lift a nose at more scavengers. A triumphant Achille, his hands gloved in blood, moved to the other canoes whose hulls were thumping with fishes. In the spread seine, the silvery mackerel multiplied the noise of coins in a basin. The copper scales swaying were balanced by one iron tear. Then there was peace. They washed their short knives. They wrapped the flower bag sails. Then they helped him haul in God we troused back in place, jamming logs under its keel. He felt his muscles unknotting like rope. The nets were closing their eyes sagging on bamboo poles near the concrete depot. In the standpipe's sandy trough, aching Achilles washed sand from his heels, then tightened the brass spigot to its last drop. An immense lilac emptiness settled the sea. He sniffed his name in one armpit. He scraped dry scales off his hands. He liked the odors of the sea in him. Night was fanning its coal pot from one catching star. The no pain lit its doors in the village. Achille put the wedge of dolphin that he'd saved for Helen in Hector's rusty tin. A full moon shone like a slice of raw onion. When he left the beach, the sea was still going on. Thank you. The most surprising thing about growing older, that it could happen, I think. <laughs> I mean, I look in the mirror and I say, who is this guy? Boy, he's old. <clears throat> um, no, I think, very seriously, I think the benediction of grandchildren is immeasurable and miraculous, frankly. You mean that there should be something that would be more home than the sail, you mean? Is it better for our imaginary Africa to be more like the one we find when we go there, or better if it's not like the Africa? Well, all I meant was that this sail is also a, a symbol of separation and distance and longing and arrival and departure, and that's the emblem I mean when I think of the single sail, because we are islands, and the same way that Ulysses moved from island to island, to adventure to adventure, and finally arrived at home, it's the same process that we have, I think, in the Caribbean with all these different islands. You can see the other island. There's like a regular 23-mile distance between certain islands, between, say, um, you know, St. Lucia and St. Vincent, between St. Vincent and Grenada, between Grenada and Trinidad. You know, an average of 23-mile distance in the channel. So that sense of, you know, going up the scale is a very Caribbean experience. I haven't been to Africa. Um, 
I don't know if there's a single symbol um, that I have that would mean something to me separate from the idea of the symbol of the sail. Um, it would be better if, there were not a, if it were not a symbol of separation or distance or longing, but that is the story, that is the spiritual part of the reality. Well, theoretically, everybody's native country is special. What makes it important for me is, or made it important for me, uh, was its newness. It was an unwritten, unpainted, not too much island with a new people who had suffered a lot, but they were new people, and um, I felt lucky to want to be able to try to articulate uh, through, through me, in English, um, what they had gone through. It's a, St. Lucia is a bilingual island, predominantly French Creole. Uh, so there's another language to have, which to me is a very rich language, French Creole. But I had that luck to have those two languages. And the mythology and um, folklore that's still there in the island uh, was extremely, I keep saying the word rich, but extremely, um, I felt it a benediction to be there, really. Um, maybe that came later, but certainly when I was beginning as a painter and as a writer, I felt very, very privileged and I still feel that about the Caribbean, but particularly about St. Lucia. The story of Haiti, the drama of Haiti is phenomenal in terms of what it contains. Um, there's an English writer who said that, kind of an early Imus uh, fraud, said, um, he said about the Caribbean that there are no people there in the true sense of the word. It's a pretty heavy insult. There are no people there in the true sense of the word. I don't know what the true sense of the word means, but he was saying the people who lived in the Caribbean are not really a people. So that's part of what one is used to taking. Um, and he said that uh, it would be Philo Negro enthusiasm that would make a hero out of Toussaint, English writer. Well, if you read the history and you know what Toussaint did as a general, as a guerrilla general, um, at least in terms of military appreciation, you could hardly call your appreciation Philo Negro. It's just a fact that he was a terrific leader. And so there are these men who, um, like Toussaint and Christophe and Dessalines, Haitian leaders um, who defeated this massive army that Napoleon sent there through guerrilla warfare and their techniques and so on. But the obscenity of the cruelty of Haiti in those times is horrible. It includes, quite apart from setting dogs on them, burying slaves, we don't want to hear all of that necessarily, but burying slaves up to their necks and putting honey on their faces and letting the ants go after them. I mean, that's the kind of fun that was there. Now, since it's not important, since they were not a people, one shouldn't bother about that. But since, being, being cynical of course, but since in reality, the agonies that they had to undergo as slaves, the punishment and so on, and of course there was a lot of self self-murder, self-torture in that evolution of Haiti. Um, but it is theatrical, to say the least, in terms of these men who developed um, the power of their armies, the guerrilla armies, and then elected themselves kings. Um, the way to look at it, you can look at it cynically and say, oh, here are these Negroes pretending that they're kings. Um, but it would be not any different if anybody elected himself dictator or elected himself um, tribal leader. So that's the direction anyway that power takes. So that these Haitian generals who, be, who call themselves kings were simply going the simple direction of being obeys or chiefs, uh, but using an English definition of what they were. 
Um, and once when I was doing research for the play, I remember that the writer was saying, oh, very cynical, um, that when Christoph, for instance, formed a court, he called his, um, the men on his court, his cabinet, he gave them names like the Duke of Lemonade and the Duke of Marmalade. And I thought, oh, this, this is a very silly. But the reality was that the provinces were called Marmalade and Limonade. So he wasn't calling them the Duke of Lemonade. And even if he was, he was saying you're a Duke de Limonade, which is not funny in French. But if a black man does it, it's hilarious. That's the kind of history you want to, to study, you know, and fight through that into a reality of um, what Dessalines or Christoph did. You see, if it's black, if it's black, it's barbarous, really barbarous. If it's white, it's history. We didn't study um, Homer and Virgil at St. Mary's College. We did Latin. And if, you know, and you translated Latin, it was a good thing. I think Latin should never be lost. Um, but in terms of saying reading those books, no, we did our own reading. The thing I commend was that um, if the literature that you had to read, whether it was English or French literature or Latin literature, is something that I, you know, I think probably went out of secondary schooling. I don't know if it's still there. Uh, and I think that that's a diminishing of the education. Um, I think Latin should never have been abandoned and so on um, because you just miss it when you get to be an older writer of poetry particularly that you wish you could read of it. I can't easily or at all really read of it or Virgil for that matter but um, to have had the basics of doing Latin and reading very important books in the curriculum like you know you did Shakespeare and you did Walter Scott you did, you know, classical. That sense, classical, yes. This country is still, uh, which is not going to be news to you, it's still very segregated culturally. Um, so that a terrific writer like August Wilson had to insist on the separation that he wanted to happen so that it could advance black theater in this country. Um, I don't want to go down this because that's going to start a whole long talk about things. But what I'm saying is that um, in some cases, I think a writer, in particular cases, I think a writer has to instruct as well as entertain. Um, once you don't make the instruction boring, uh, and that can happen in certain situations, I, I certainly think that in terms of, say, the black writer here, that that's an inescapable um, duty in a way to instruct as well as to entertain. People may dismiss it and say I'm not here to teach politics or not to write politically but it's very difficult not to be political in situations like that no matter what you write because it's looked on as a political act. <clears throat> the writing, the judgment of the writing is political judgment not aesthetic. I think the basic question is whether I like this country and yes I do. <laughs> Um, if I don't like it, why am I working here? No. No, I like America a lot, and I, have, I owe a lot to America. I'm not ashamed or embarrassed to say that I'm not anybody's slave or servant. I'm just saying that there's been a generosity here in this country for me, towards me, to me individually, that I'm very grateful for. Um, and that doesn't make me some kind of house slave or something. Um, but if you look at the universal situation of this country, the foreign policy of America is not America. I don't consider American foreign policy to be the idea of every American. I don't think that this country has a, the, the average American. If you take the Roman, the Englishman, the Frenchman, the European, uh, under a certain government, under a certain regime, whether it's a royal uh, monarchy or a dictatorship or a democratic government, you identify the citizen with the destiny of that country. In other words, 
and the pride that goes with that country. So that the Frenchman is very proud of France, no matter what France has done. Um, there's, you know, the French Empire. There have been all of these countries have had empires. America had never had the wish, I think, to be an empire. It didn't need to. It had enough money to be by itself. It didn't need anybody, uh, and it wound up being an empire. Maybe that was the destiny of America to become an empire. What it does now from someone in America or looking at it from outside America is very abhorrent to someone who is not an American. But my defense of that is that is not the American will. The Americans I know don't want to be, you know, living in Iraq and running it, whereas the Roman might have. And certainly the Indian and the Englishman, for instance, the English in India, you know, there was a career in India um, as an empire, a huge country, and the foreign office designed itself in terms of getting jobs for people in India. Uh, that's not the kind of thing that this country has done. It's not a, something that this country wants to do. So I separate American foreign policy from America. Um, I don't think I could say that even as an ex-colonial about the British Empire or the French Empire in Martinique where uh, the law was represented by white gendarmes up to very recently. That was the law. The law was white in French colonies. And then people get surprised at Vietnam, etc., or Algeria, etc. But it's kind of late to start that, so let's... I'd like to thank you for the invitation, the honor of reading here, and good night. Mm -hmm.